I gotta do two videos a day, so I'm sorry. But today's an interesting topic, good topic, peripheral artery disease. Yeah. PAD, PVD, atherosclerosis. All of those are basically the same thing. We're talking about the deposition of material in an artery. That is as simple a diagnosis as you can get. They go with peripheral vascular disease because you sometimes get some problems with the veins, but those are rare and we're not talking about that. Um, that pretty much sums up if people have swollen legs in their lower extremities. Now, Peripheral artery disease is the biggest issue. This is when you smoke, drink, do all kinds of things and your body can't handle it. When it can't handle it, you end up depositing little bits of calcium, little bits of white blood cells, little bits of biological material in these arteries. As you can think of, it's not a matter of the artery narrowing like this. It's a matter of having a little blockage on the side, sometimes on two sides, three sides, four sides. So it, the flow functionally gets narrowed. When that happens, once it goes a greater than 50% stenosis, that's the magic number, 50%. Once you have greater than 50% stenosis, that's usually when you start developing symptoms. The problem with that is that sometimes those blockages aren't just smooth, they're rugged. And if they have rugged or an ulceration in them, you can sometimes get a plaque that forms, excuse me, a clot that forms in that, breaks off and goes downstream. So that's when you get a stroke. That's when you can have a heart attack. Uh, that's when you get acute symptoms from peripheral vascular disease. That's pretty much it. The rest of the stuff we'll go over, but if you understand that concept, then you understand what kind of problems you'll have from peripheral vascular disease or peripheral arterial disease. PAD, narrowing of blockage, arteries due to plaque formation resulting in tissue ischemia. Again, if you don't have blood flow to something longer than eight hours, you run into problems. Blocking these arteries can cause that, and then that's when you get symptoms. Just to review the anatomy a little bit, again, this is a normal artery. This is what happens when you get plaque buildup on the sides. And again, the magic number is 50. Greater than 50%, whether it's in your arms or legs, um, anywhere, that's when you start getting symptoms of peripheral whatever. So. Be careful with that. Now, risk factors, age greater than 60, just because you've been around a long time, and then adding in a lot of other behaviors. Smoking, probably up there with diabetes, those two pretty much go hand in hand. When I have a patient come in with peripheral artery disease that's, over the, that's under the age of 60, they've either been smoking a pack or two a day or have poorly controlled diabetes. The combination of these two guarantees that you're going to lose a finger, toe, something at some point. I have plenty of videos all over the place of me cutting off toes and legs and just about all of those patients have smoke and have diabetes. Obesity, again, eating too much food and it's one thing if you're eating too much lettuce but a lot of times to get obese you're not. So you're eating high cholesterol foods which causes hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol. Um, being black or Hispanic, uh, people of color are higher risk, hypertension, especially when it's poorly controlled hypertension, and a family history of coronary artery disease or peripheral vascular disease puts you at risk. Also, chronic kidney disease puts you at a risk for these problems. So if you fit into one of these groups, you need to make sure that if you have tingling, if you have um, rest pain in your legs when you're just sitting on the bed and it still hurts. If you have claudication, you walk too far and your legs hurt and then you have to sit down, that's a sign that you have something. Ideally, if you are just over 60, you're okay. If you're just black, you're okay. If you're just obese, you might be okay. Um, if you're a diabetic, you still have to watch for this, but just diabetes is well controlled, you might be okay. But once you start adding one or two risk factors, you start coming into a lot of problems. Now, one thing that you hear me say a lot about is claudication. Claudication is 
when you have pain in your calf, after you're walking to the mailbox, you have to sit down, wait. Five minutes later, that pain goes away, and then you can walk again, that's claudication. That occurs because you don't have enough blood flow to your calves. When you walk, you burn all of the oxygen that you have going to your calves above and beyond what your body can take. You get claudication because of the buildup of lactate. You can look at it all that if you want to. But you have to wait for your venous return to get all the blood out and your body to get oxygenated blood to your calf, and then you can walk again. Same thing kind of happens in the heart with um, heart disease. If you have that, then you need to go see the doctor and they need to do tests. We'll talk about the tests later. Some other signs that you get are tingling, cramping, weakness, and numbness in the extremities, pain in the feet or toes, non-healing wounds or ulcers. This is really a big problem for diabetics because they get microvascular disease. Quick thing microvascular disease versus macrovascular disease. You'll hear that come up a lot of time on general surgery rotations or when you see your doctor. Microvascular disease means essentially small vessels. You're getting deposition of usually calcium or some type of byproduct in these small vessels. So you will see people lose fingers, you'll see people lose toes, you see, you'll see people go blind in their eyes because of destruction of microvascular disease. That typically is something you see with diabetes. When you start talking about macrovascular disease, you start, you're looking at deposition of those same byproducts, but we're talking about in the extremities, you're talking about in the aorta, the largest vessel in your body, talking about in your carotid arteries. That's, that's macro. Macro is traditionally seen with people who smoke. Microdiabetes, when you add smoking and diabetes, that's when you start to lose legs. Skin discoloration is changing because you're not able to get blood flow in and out of an extremity correctly. So you have the buildup of those products and you get what's called brawny edema or basically discoloration of your lower extremities around your calves. The skin's cool because it doesn't have good blood supply. Commonly presents asymptomatically. So what that essentially means is these are all late signs. So once you get to claudication, you've had it for a while. Once you get to tingling and cramping, you've had it for a while. This is something that your primary doctor absolutely has to check when you have one of these risk factors, excuse me, two of these risk factors. Now, how do they check? The very first thing we do is what's called an ABI, ankle brachial index. That is essentially we put a blood pressure cuff on your arm and we put a blood pressure cuff on your leg. We then look at the ratio of the two. If your ratio is greater than 0.9, then you're okay. All that means is there's maybe a little gravity difference, maybe your little weight but it's nothing to worry about. As you get into the 0 0.8s, 0 0.7s, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, you then start looking at symptoms. You will have an increase in symptoms as your ABI gets smaller. If you get into 0.3, that's when you start worrying about tissue loss, significant peripheral vascular disease. So this is an ultrasound test as well, so they will send you for an ABI. You'll also get an ultrasound of your bilateral lower extremities. The ultrasound looks at the arteries to look to see if you have any deposition of calcium. You can see calcium on a ultrasound, especially if it's a Doppler where you're looking at flow. They will also do a Doppler of your carotid arteries to look and see if you have a blockage in your arteries of your neck. We'll get into carotid artery disease later down the line. A dedicated vascular ultrasound pretty much does all of this stuff. Now, the very first time you're diagnosed with peripheral artery disease, if you are lucky to get caught around an ABI of 0.8.7, the first thing we always address is lifestyle modification. 
Stop smoking. Stop eating fat burgers all the time. Exercise three times a week greater than 30 minutes to increase your ability to move around, blood flow, exercise are hard. Your whole body's a muscle. The more you use it, the more efficient it becomes. Because hypertension and hyperlipidemia are very high risk, um, put you very high risk, starting people on blood pressure medication, starting people on um, some statins to lower your cholesterol is also one of the first lines. I have been on cholesterol medicine since I was 21 years old and I've been on blood pressure medicine since I was 21 years old, but the sole reason that I'm black and I have a family history of peripheral vascular disease and peripheral artery disease. So I've been on medicine for the last, I don't know what is that, 20 something years because of the risk factors, because I don't want to lose my legs. Don't want to lose my hands. Nobody likes a surgeon with no hands. So yes, do it. Now, antiplatelet therapy. I take aspirin too. I don't take a baby aspirin, I used to, now I take a full dose, but a baby aspirin. I think that realistically, if you have more than one of these risk factors, making, if you check your blood pressure all the time, high cholesterol, and taking a baby aspirin is a good, aspirin is a good idea. Yeah, so I do that. Plavix is a new one on, on, uh, on the market, probably, it's not new now, it's one of the most prescribed drugs on the planet now, but Plavix has been around, it's a little stronger than aspirin, and it is saving people lives and legs and hearts because of peripheral artery disease and heart disease. You do all this, if your ABI is six, seven, eight, nine, you're, you will be okay. If you start getting into five, four, threes, you need something else. Before 2000, uh, let's see, I graduated 2005. So we'll say around 2005, we'll call that the magic number. 2005, peripheral artery bypass, we used to do that all the time. Um, removing the clotted off material from the artery, we used to do that all the time, arthrectomies, we used to do that all the time. Now, since 2005, the primary treatment for peripheral artery disease is angioplasty, plus or minus stent, usually always plus stent. The reason is, it's easier to access, you can stent lesions that aren't bad or symptomatic early, and extend the life of that limb. If you had, if you came in, came in the operating room or came in the emergency room before 2005, cold leg, we take you to the operating room, open the artery up, clot, open it up, do what we can, do an emergency bypass, do uh, Fogarty catheters to pull clots out to be able to save the leg. Now, all that is done by cardiology and interventional radiology um, via sheaths the same way that we do it when you have a heart cath. So this is number one. Then we can go in, if you have a blockage in your common femoral artery or a large artery, we will go in and take that plaque out. And once we do that, restore that flow, you're okay. When that doesn't work or it's completely clotted off because your symptoms weren't recognized early, then we start discussing peripheral artery bypass. Or if this one fails, this one fails, then you have to go to this. One medicine that we use, um, a couple medicines that we use, help with claudication and sometimes can be the difference between someone having bad symptoms and not having bad symptoms. What, this, what these medicines do is essentially, if you're red blood cell is hard like this and fixed. Once you start taking these medicines like Platol, what happens is it makes it more pliable. So it has the ability to get into spaces that it normally doesn't. So those small blockages that you can get into those with blood vessels, I mean blood cells because they're more pliable. So that actually works pretty good. You see a lot of good results 
with that in some patients. That's probably the one medicine that I write for the most if they're not already on an antihypertensive, a statin, and an aspirin. Patients with peripheral artery disease are at risk of developing coronary artery disease, heart disease, strokes. Understand that if you can knock off a very large vessel, you can also knock off a medium-sized vessel going to your brain or a very small vessel going to your brain or your heart. So if you have this, this also needs to be screened for. The majority of patients that I see in my clinic who come in for peripheral artery disease and they already have a stent, they've either already had, already had a heart attack or they're getting screened for their carotid arteries at the same time. So it is real. And again, it makes sense. If you can block off a large artery, you can block off a medium, you can block off a small artery. All in all, we'll go through some of the different amputations. We'll go through vascular surgery. We'll talk about carotid surgery. The most important thing is this part here. Understanding your risk factors, understanding, yes, I have diabetes and I should not be smoking. Yes, I have diabetes and a family history of peripheral artery disease. My uncle, my grandmother, whoever lost a leg, you should not be smoking. If that's your takeaway from this, then you learn something. And again, aspirin, antihypertensive, statin. If you're at risk for peripheral artery disease, you need to be on one of those medicines. That's pretty much it. Informational. Um, we'll get into surgery and stuff later. Hope that answers your question, guys. Oh, DM me, Instagram. Um, I don't really use Facebook that much, but whatever you can to be able to get me some questions, I'll get them answered. Hope you're all doing well. Take care. Ain't nothing wrong with thunder when the rain.